Hey guys, welcome to the second session of the third week of PGHC. Today's session is going to be focusing on human resources for health, which is an important topic in uh, low and middle income countries, as we have a shortage of uh, health, human resources for health. This session is going to be led by Dr. Anatole Manzi. Dr. Anatole Manzi is an assistant professor here at UGHC. He also is the Deputy Chief Medical Officer in charge of clinical quality and health system strengthening at Partners in Health. On top of that, he directs uh, the Learning Collaborative for the U.S. Public Health Accompaniment Unit, which is a program that's being uh, implemented by uh, Partners in Health uh, during this time of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Dr. Manzi has a range of experience in uh, health system strengthening, and I hope you guys will enjoy uh, his session. Enjoy. Hi, Anatoly Manzi here, Assistant Professor at University of Global Health Equity. I also have my affiliations with the Partners in Health, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. I'm here to teach human resources for health. I'm really excited to have you present and ready to take on this course. Let's get started. I'll go ahead and share my screen. I guess we can follow together this class. We will examine the status and the framework of human resources for health. We will review all together the major success and pitfalls of human resources development, an understanding of evolution of human resources, and we will discuss the role of health workforce as a strategy to advance UHC and other national and global health priorities. We will finally have a brief review and discussion of strategies to address the scarcity of human resources for health. Let's have a quick review of the key concepts. It's really important to recall what is exactly health. As defined by WHO, it's a state of a complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease. This is a very important definition. It helps us to understand what do we mean with the human resources for health. Then what will be the health workforce? Eventually, it's defined as all people engaged in action whose primary intent is to enhance health. Remember, this health workforce should be responsive, fair, efficient, and available in sufficient numbers. This is the definition from the World Health Organization. Where well, I would like to really go back a little bit and talk about the declaration that we know. As you remember, it may have cover, been covered in other courses. In September 1978, there have been this declaration of Alma'ata. And within this declaration, something very important came out. Primary health care. And this was a beginning of a thorough understanding of who going to be delivering primary health care. And everyone had a consensus that the health workers, including physicians and nurses, midwives, auxiliaries, and community workers. These are well known as community, as health workers. However, the definition of health worker is now taking another shape. Because of the key players, the list can go and be long. Well, this declaration aimed at having health for all by year 2000. As many of you may remember, not everyone reached health in 2000. In fact, we remember 
some of the poor health outcome that we had in year 2000. That led to the another declaration of global commitment, which is the universe, uh, the Millennium Development Goals. Very interesting. Millennium Development Goals will another attempt to be more proactive. This will eight goals, including eradicating extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal um, primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and a global partnership for development. Did we achieve those goals? No, but there have been significant improvements in all across these goals. Well, the workforce was really key for any progress ever made. There have been significant investments in human resources. Well, in 2015, which was actually the actual deadline of these Millennium Development Goals, there have been another commitment that we all know as Sustainable Development Goals. These are 17 goals. I will not go through all these 17, but one that may be of interest now is the goal regarding health, good health and well-being. This goal has one target that I think we should really pay attention to. This target on HRH, substantially increase health financing and the recruitment, development, training and retention of health workforce in developing countries, especially in the least developed countries. This is a target human resources has been targeted as a strategy for us to achieve sustainable development goals well let's have a quick review on how do we measure the workforce performance the world health organization has studied a number of dimensions one availability competence responsiveness and productivity. When it comes to availability, it's looking at ratios. I do remember many reports coming out talking about Africa having one physician per 5,000 population. That's a measure. It's one dimension that mentioned on availability. And I can also see if you get in the hospital or health center and you see how often is the nurse absent, that also looking at availability. You probably recall this one. When you are at a health facility and it takes you hours and hours to be seen by a health worker, that's also another indicator that you look at, especially when we are looking at the availability of health workers. The competency is really important because with human resources, we look at both availability, but also the competency they have to tackle the population health issues. Well, in terms of competencies, you can look at prescribing behaviors, for example, Prescribing practices. So what is the proportion of our health workers with the correct prescription? That can give us an idea on how competent is our workforce. Another on responsiveness, looking at how satisfied is the community, patients, families using these health services. Obviously, productivity is very important. Looking at how many visits, how many uh, interventions, how many children vaccinated. So all these are indicators that really help us to know 
how we are and how competent, how performing is our, our workforce. Well, this is just a background information. There's a very important consideration as we think about human resources for health, especially in current time. It is important to think about where do we go with human resources? The IHME at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation has recently published a projection showing a, a dramatic increase in the global population. And this dramatic increase in global population it is predicted to really be this exponential until 2064. What does it mean in terms of human resources? Ideally, the more population we have, the more workforce we should have. Is that true? Absolutely not. It is a challenge that many countries, especially developing countries, have. Obviously, there's also that prediction that after 2064, there will be a decline of the population and that, that decrease will be resulted, will result in, will be a consequence of, you know, improved access to uh, contraceptive methods and education, especially for women. Well, we will not talk about that piece, but we have ahead of us, a dramatic increase in the population, eventually that should mean a dramatic and intentional investment in human resources production. Another important consideration is the life expectancy. And this is defined as the average number of years that a person is expected to live. There have been dramatic changes, improvement in life expectancy, especially in low and middle income countries. And some of them doubled and tripled the, the, the life expectancy. Is it a good thing? Absolutely. However, there's a, a, an issue in terms of health workforce. In many countries, we don't see the workforce necessary to address health needs for this aging population. Eventually, we know that more um, uh, parents are staying with their children for many years. The longer they're gonna live, they will require specialized care. And many countries are not prepared for that. Another important consideration is the shift, that the shift, the shift in the global burden of disease, excuse me. Well, let's look in, let's look at this. In 1990, respiratory infections and TB and maternal and neonatal factors, they were on top of the global burden. But we could see dramatic shift in, in the burden of disease having cardiovascular diseases becoming the top. What this means is the need for a specialized health workforce and the training, the numbers, and eventually other aspects of health workforce are needed. This means we need a new workforce ready to tackle cardiovascular diseases. And this may require other resources that we are not necessarily ready to afford. And this shift in the global burden of disease is really an important consideration because it makes the workforce an urgent need for countries to cope with the current situation. We all know the emergence of global pandemics. Obviously, this is well known, but in terms of health workforce, this is a critical factor and a, a, a very important predictor of, of uh, health workforce. Over the past two decades, we moved from HIV to 
um, H1N1, from H1N1 to Zika, from Zika to Ebola, from Ebola to COVID-19, and more and more and more. So that means a lot in terms of health system, but specifically when it comes to the workforce needed, we see specialty workers, specialty areas to be developed. We see the needs in terms of numbers and expertise needed for the workforce to deal with the situation. This is a very important predictor, especially in this century. The World Health Organization tried to predict the shortages that needed, and these shortages were predicted for 2013 and the, the ones for 2030. So what do we predict to happen, especially as we get into 2030? So now we see almost only 10 years left for us to get into that cutoff where we were expecting to have a transformed community. So we see a, 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 a shortage. When you look at regions like Africa, you see a 45% shortage in health worker. This is a really important consideration. And the total number of work, uh, health workers needed is reaching 15 million. And this could be up to 18 million other predictor, other uh, uh, evaluations have shown. Well, the total number of health workers needed to reach SDGs, uh, SDG threshold estimated for 2013 and forecasted for 2030 is actually showing the same situation that especially regions like Africa will need, we, we need to increase the workforce by 51%. This is almost impossible in history, but it's also showing the magnitude of the, the need, especially in low and middle income countries. Well, looking at those factors, eventually the, 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 there's a, the, the health workforce is, is a very important driver of uh, universal health coverage. Very important because until now, over 400 million people have no basic health care. And it's already known that every two seconds, someone aged 30 to 70 years old will die, is dying prematurely due to non communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular diseases. Well, there have been a recent evaluation by IHME, which was really important, showing what is the evolution of the working age population. And this is really defined as the number of uh, people who are less, who are under 65 years old. And this is really a working population. If you look at it across the region, you see that there's a decline in the working population. The working the working age population is going to be stagnant or decreasing in many regions, except one, the Africa region, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. So now I have a question: Will this working age address human resources gaps in Africa? I think this is a very important consideration. So if we are to see over the, the next um, 80 years, if we are seeing an increase in the working age population, should we expect that the gap in human resources is going to be addressed? This is hard to answer. Why? Because we still have these bottlenecks. 
the ones we produce are facing issues, double burdened. We see the workforce shortages, but also we see the high burden of disease, low resource base. We see limited training opportunities, weak education system, poor work conditions, shortages in supplies, preference of urban over rural areas, which is very obvious, especially when health workers are in rural areas, they do not necessarily have the same opportunities as those who are in urban areas. The high rates of disease, even among the health workers, especially HIV, TB, and other diseases. The brain drain, we still have issues with health workers trained, but joining private sectors and non-profit non organizations and international communities. Well, it is actually estimated that now in the Europe especially, the percent of migrant nurses and physicians working in developing countries, this especially Europe, has increased by 60%. And this increase will continue. Eventually, if you ask it the same question that now having Africa, having the increasing number of, of the working age population, is it promising? It's yes and no. If we train those who are going to migrate to other countries, it may be challenging to say that we will be able to address population health needs or uh, close the gap in terms of human resources for health. The World Health Organization has six components of HRH, and these six components are critical, especially when you want to address human resources needs. The first is leadership. And this is very critical. The capacity to provide directions, to align people, to mobilize resources. So investing in resources is really critical to have a solid uh, HRH. The second component is a partnership. We know that there's a need to link building linkage between stakeholders who can help and maximize the use of the resources they have to eventually strengthen the workforce within the countries. The policies, especially when it comes to rules and regulations, it's a very important area that we need to invest in. And that's really recommended, especially to ensure we have a certain level of standardization and more practices. Finance, obviously, resource allocation and sourcing, securing funding to support human resources is critical. Education is another component of HRH. Obviously, this means producing highly competent workforce. Then finally, the management system. HRH management systems is really important because we need to ensure that we have an integrated use of data and policy and practice. We have a better way to forecast how many health workforce we will need, how much we need to address the gap we have now. There have been so many ways that countries have been trying to address the health workforce needs. One is task shifting, and this is defined as a process to move some responsibilities to health workers with a shorter training and fewer qualifications. And this has been a very critical, especially when many countries were trying to address HIV needs. An example of task shifting, especially for HIV care and treatment. This is a study that was conducted to look at the effectiveness and cost implications of task shifting in the delivery of ART, antiretroviral therapy. 
As you know, many countries were relying on physicians, doctors, to be able to prescribe HIV medication and other related care. Well, the task shifting was really taking these same responsibilities from the physicians to nurses and other uh, healthcare providers. This study was looking at the outcome. After rolling out of this task shifting, what did we see in terms of population or patient outcomes? What did we see in terms of virologic outcomes? What, what happened in terms of adherence to medication and other practices? Well, the study was comparing these outcomes, whether the, the patient is managed by nurses or these other workers versus uh, physicians. Well, it is very impressive to see what they found. Most of the studies involved in this systematic review found no significant can difference between uh, patients managed by these non-physician and those managed by physician, suggesting that eventually the care provided by these non-physicians was as good as the care provided by standard care provided by, 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 by doctors. Very impressive. And also suggesting the study concluded that task shifting from doctors to nurses or from healthcare profession to lay uh, health workers can result in substantial costs and physician time savings. Imagine if it's one physician who was supposed to prescribe all medication follow-up on all patients. If you save that time, he or she would focus on other priorities that the community has. This has been really effective, and I was particularly involved with HIV task shifting. It was really impressive to see what people meant to be impossible being possible. And now we have pretty much that universal health coverage in terms of HIV care and treatment. Another study looked at the effectiveness of community-based practitioners. And eventually, in Kenya, Indonesia, and Ethiopia, what WHO assessed the, 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 the quality and life saved by these community-based interventions. And it's very impressive to see how these community-based practitioners, mainly midwives, are focusing on neonatal care and maternal health have really improved the situation and this the effective uh, uh, effectiveness expressed in uh, or re, you know uh, reported in lives saved well that's already known that community based interventions are really effective but again when we talk about hrh there's there are some persistent challenges it could be in the numbers in most of countries, we still see the shortage, shortage of, of, of health workers. And also it could be the, the, the need to the, the skill mix, the health team balance, the mis dis distribution of, of health workers, the imbalance where you see more in, in, in urban settings while the community, the, the, the rural settings have no enough physicians or other healthcare workers. The working conditions were the compensation. So over the past five years, I have been part of discussions to talk about uh, strikes where nurses and physicians had to go, and especially because they have no en enough uh, in terms of compensation the World Health Organization prepared these you know, policies that are really critical. So four areas, four policy areas that we need to focus on we, if we really need to address the HRH name. So the first one is on production, on infrastructure and materials. 
enrollment, even selecting students who are going to health, um, health, who are taking on health education programs. The second one is policy to address inflow and outflow. How do we deal with migration or emigration of health workers? How do we attract unemployed workers to really join the health services? How do we bring health workers back into health sector? Because it is now well noted that many health workers are deciding to take on other domains and of business and eventually leave the profession. Another policy that the World Health Organization is really pushing is to address maldistribution of inefficiencies. And again, when WHO put forward this kind of policy is to really recommend countries to invest in these policies and really have make this more operational to improve productivity and performance, to improve the skills and mixed composition, to retain the health workers underserved in underserved areas. So then the last um, uh, policies include more regulation, especially with, when it comes to private and the public sector. So how to manage dual practice, especially when physician nurses would like to work um, in two settings, especially which is very common, especially as a way, as a means to increase their revenue, to improve quality of training and to enhance service delivery. Any conclusion, human resources is, is, is critical for us to have a solid health system and for us to move towards SDGs, it's critical that two things, human resources and education, if we could address those, we could address approximately 80% of the gap we have to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. Number two, we need more healthcare workers. Obviously, making sure that we have well-trained workers and we have a retention strategy and we define healthcare workers based on the burden of disease. If we see more cardiovascular disease becoming the predominant, we need to invest in specialty domains. We need to prepare our community health workers, our nurses, our physicians to get ready to address those needs. We need to think about where do we assign them, the distribution. We know that the rural areas are really in need of health workers, so that's really important. We need to revisit traditional supervision approaches that are really based on blame and data collection and invest more in uh, supportive supervision and, and mentorship, which are geared towards building capacity and performance. Task shifting has been proven effective from HIV to um, you know, other infections task shifting could be an alternative solution, especially as countries deal with the long-term solutions to address HRH needs. Community-based uh, programs and workforce is the way to go because we need to ensure that the community is a part of the solution and the community should be part of the, the workforce and not be left behind. I have a number of references. With these references, you could always see more of investments from the World Health Organization, from the uh, World Bank, and other multilateral organizations, but also the strategies that countries are adopting to strengthen their uh, human resources for health. Thank you for your kind attention. In May 
2019, there have been a meeting in Geneva with the WHO. And this meeting was aiming at discussing how to invest in creating jobs and addressing the healthcare worker needs. There have been some key messages, six messages that were shared prior to that meeting. And those messages were really critical for the participants of the meeting to really think about where they should invest more efforts. Are these still relevant to address the current gaps in HRH and explain why? Who should facilitate the implementation of these messages? Explain why and how. Some instructions below. I expect to have three groups, but we can have more or less depending on the time and the size. Each group will prepare and deliver a 10 to a five to 10 minute presentation, summarizing what you would have discussed. Let me go back to those messages. These six messages are below. The first two were to join forces across professions to move together. The second was to implement what works. The group one, you will discuss this. The second group, you will discuss these two other messages. Invest in health worker jobs for UHC, universal health coverage, and inclusive growth. The second is activate the power of youth. The third group you will discuss include decent work and eliminate discrimination. The second is harness technology to maximize impact. If you could spend a time discussing this and make that presentation, again, some guiding questions are here. Feel free to ask if you have any questions. Thank you. I very much hope to see you again, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Have a great day. Bye.